thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I am your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a man who never leaves Tupperware in the office refrigerator too long, Mike Vandebogart. <laughs> How's it going, everyone? Excited to be back for part two of the Hood and LaRue case. Uh, before we get into the case, we've got some exciting announcements. Uh, first announcement is, after our episode we did on the Arvin Nelson uh, interview, a Facebook group has popped up on our Facebook page, Locations Unknown. Um, Facebook user Andrew Quintana has really been leading the charge, so a quick shout out to him. He's been posting a lot of uh, really cool content and pictures and stories from Arvin's life. So if you listen to the interview, he was the one mentioned as Drew in the interview, so he was a good high school friend of Arvin's, and it has been incredible the community that has rallied around. Arvin, even still now, like it's, you can go on our site and see the group. I mean, there is dozens and dozens of high school photos and people recounting stories and friends of his. You can just tell what a momentous impact Arvin had on pretty much everyone he met. It's insane. Yeah, it's really cool. And it, it you almost feel, I almost feel like I knew Arvin with how much uh, I know. <laughs> photos and stuff they've posted of him. So I don't remember my own past that well. <laughs> So yeah, uh, thanks to uh, Andrew Quintana and a lot of the other people in the group that have been posting stories about Arvin. If you haven't checked it out yet, head over to our Facebook page and look for the Arvin Nelson group. Yeah, Drew, stellar job, man. Stellar. We also got some sad news uh, recently. So well, way back we did a, a case on Paul Miller. He was a missing Canadian in Joshua Tree National Park. And on December 19th, uh, human remains were found in the area where Paul had went missing and uh, sure enough it turned out to be uh, Paul Miller they found the skeletal remains um, so there's still no uh, it, official explanation as what caused his death I'm sure uh, I'm sure we'll know eventually um, but yeah Joe do you have anything to add on the, the Paul Miller update yeah I think um, it was so what it seemed like was they said it was photographs from drone flyovers that actually found the location. So it's, if you remember from our interview at the PIO at Joshua Tree, he talked about how they had this new technology where they did, they took thousands of photographs and they created like this mosaic and the computer image is what actually looked for the anomalies. Yeah. So they, that actually worked. It sounds like that worked and they were able to locate it. And there was a quote from Paul's wife uh, with a local newspaper, The Desert Sun. Um, they said they're, they're speculating. Well, actually, this was his sister said that they're speculating that it was either heat stroke or a heart attack. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul's wife, Stephanie, offered more details, said he was found in a shaded area and still had water and food. And it appeared that he was made the hike to 49 Palms Oasis and was coming back out the wrong way. Okay. So he actually wasn't coming out the wrong path. Yeah. And uh, from what they said, where they discovered the remains was not too far off where teams had uh, marked that they searched. Yeah. So the family had said that they have comfort knowing that he probably didn't suffer long because the reasoning was the search parties got within shouting distance uh, where they could communicate. So it's quite possible, as awful as it sounds, that he perished relatively quickly. Um, I personally, I think the heart attack thing is a very likely scenario, as unfortunate as it is. But I, I would say we, we hope he didn't suffer. Mm -hmm. And the silver lining is I think it's it's really good the family can get a little bit of closure, as terrible as the whole situation is. Probably in the coming months, we'll we'll get more information from the coroner on you know exact cause of death, or what you know they speculate was the cause of death. So when we hear more information on that, we'll we'll publish that on our, our Facebook page. 
we've been in direct contact with his sister uh, and other family friends that have been running various Facebook groups for finding him and, and other other sites that have been used to, to find him. So they have been reaching out to us regularly and giving us updates and we always try and honor their privacy. So please don't, uh, I know as, as they stated now, don't try and reach out to the Miller family. I'm sure they just wanna go through this, but we appreciate working with them and also getting the information from Joshua Tree and doing what we can to help out. Exactly. We wanna thank Verger CBD products for helping keep the show's lights on. Verger CBD has been a longtime sponsor of our show and they've helped out. So they carry, if you're not familiar with CBD companies, they, they typically have tinctures uh, that you put like in the mouth, under the tongue. They have some edible food products, things like that. These are non-psychoactive drugs, if you will. So if you think of CBD as like THC or ma- recreational marijuana, it actually does not get you high. So if you're looking into fight anxiety, get relaxed, help with your sleep, um, they even have ones that can help you wake up in the morning and are trying to kick prescription drugs. Check out Verger CBD products. I uh, use a lot of the products. I know, Mike, you've used some and had great success. So you can check them out at vergermed.com. That's V-E-R-D-U-R-E-M-E-D.com. All right, everybody, let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. The grisly murders of Jeffrey Hood and Molly LaRue rocked the Appalachian Trail community and the nation. In part one, we covered the multiple characters who interacted with Molly and Jeff, as well as the timeline that brought them to the Thelma Marks shelter on Cove Mountain. Unknown to the couple, they were about to cross paths with a deranged psychopath. Join us this week as we continue the case of Hood and LaRue. In our last episode, We covered a lot of content and information. We followed Earl Swift, an AT through hiker that interacted with Molly and Jeff, who then later went on to write an article on the murders for Outside Magazine. We followed Molly LaRue and Jeff Hood based on their interactions with others as well as the logbook entries along their way. Lastly, we focused on Paul David Cruz, a murderer and fugitive from the law. On the night of September 12th, 1990, the paths of these three individuals would intersect in a small shelter on the side of Cove Mountain at the bottom of a steep 500-foot side trail off of the AT. Only crews would leave that shelter the next morning. So not much is known for certain about what occurred on the night of the 12th, and we will talk about it a little bit later because we'll get into the court hearing and what his lawyer said about him. But we are, if you're listening to the first part and you're coming to this one, it's very evident that this guy has some major, major mental issues. So even the things they were able to get out of him, they're not a hundred percent sure. So I, I won't glean too much into the future other than that. But the real questions that stand are, did the couple arrive there and they were there first? Uh, was Cruz there before them? What was the conversation like? What was their interaction like? Did they upset Cruz somehow or was he already agitated for some other reason? Exactly. And I think that's that's what's really insane about this case is we left with just these two mutilated bodies. And what we learned about these individuals were that they were very nice, amazing, amazing people. I couldn't picture either of them you know, causing that kind of anger out of somebody other than, you know, a person who like you, like we've been saying, who, you know, is mentally ill. Yeah. And I I think about myself too. Like I'm a nice person and it would take a lot to get me agitated to where I could start shooting somebody. (laughs) Well, no, no, I'm I'm not not even putting in that perspective. I'm just saying like raising my voice and really getting in a, in a tussle with somebody, unless I'm playing hockey, that's different. That's just automatic. Mm -hmm. But, but when you look at these people, 
if Cruz already was in an agitated state, they're the type of people that a know how to de-escalate. Yeah. Know how to talk to people probably similar to him or like his condition and would then try and help him. Whereas somebody like me, if he's being really rude or mean, yeah. I might start getting angry too, which could really raise the tension of a situation. They would be in the position where they'd be able to defuse it potentially. And they seem like they had the experience to do it. Yeah, they have the experience of dealing with at-risk um, youth and, you know, from other from people I know that uh, work with at-risk kids, sometimes it's a challenging thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got to have a lot of patience. And I think uh, Jeff they and Molly had had, have... must have had a ton of patience. So you think they would be able to handle a situation where someone's agitated, but obviously Cruz had some underlying issues that no amount of de-escalation probably was going to help. And I'm sure, like you said, they worked with at-risk youth. Mm -hmm. You know some of those kids were violent because they came from homes that were broken or violent. So it's probably, let's hypothetically, just real quick before we get into it, say that he was in an agitated state. Mm -hmm. I I truly believe they'd know how to really de-escalate it. Yeah. For those of you who haven't seen, you can go on Facebook, we released some of the photos from that show what the shelter looks like. It was an open sided wood shelter that if you stood next to it, the top of one side would kind of go up to your shoulders, maybe your head. So it wasn't really like a house or a log cabin. It was a three sided wood shelter with a tin roof that would shed water. Essentially. It was just a place that wasn't the ground to lay under. Yeah. And to get you out of the rain, if it was raining. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it wasn't anything really, really big and fancy, but it, it was a small spot. Like mm-hmm. you, you were not intimate, but if they're both in there and he didn't start attacking right away, it's not like they were in different rooms or things like that. They're within four or five feet of each other. Not much, like I said, not much is known about that night. What we do know is that later in the day on the 13th, so this is the next day, the morning, Cruz did return to the trail and hiked north into Duncannon. Only now he was no longer carrying the two red gym bags he did have with him. He was sporting a bright green Gregory hiking pack. So this guy obviously took their stuff, left his other stuff behind. You know, he's already a fugitive. There's a description of him out there. I don't know if we if the description mentioned those two red bags, but obviously it's not very smart to, you know, leave your stuff behind. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and that's again, I think you're you're working with somebody who's I mean, he's not in any kind of normal mindset at all, not even in the least bit. So Cruz hitched a ride east on Interstate 81 and got at least one ride south before rejoining the trail in the next county far from Thelma Marks. He walks south from there. Assuming the guise of a through hiker, so he's picked up basically pretending he was a through hiker. Yeah. At the same time, a trio of southbounders that were actually chasing Jeff and Molly, so they are trying to catch up with them. They had been seeing all their posts, similar to what our writer was doing when he first started reading about them. You know, everybody seemed to want to meet these people. They were amazing people. Yeah. So they they just got into Duncannon at the same time. Gene Butcher from Tennessee. His uh, hiker name was Flat Feet. That was his trail name. <laughs> he didn't stick around in town. He hiked up Cove Mountain right away while the other two were, were staying in town. So he actually hiked up Cove Mountain shortly after Cruz had descended the same path. But Flat Feet didn't stop at Thelma Mark Shelter. He hiked past it onto the Darlington Shelter okay. area. So he would have actually come across their bodies, but he... Thelma Marks was that, uh, as we keep saying, it was like a 500-foot side trail that went down. Mm -hmm. So you had to intentionally go there. It wasn't like right off the trail. It kind of went off to the side. So he went, just kept going on the AT and headed into, uh, hiked on to Darlington. There he found the shelter littered with trash, including an empty red gym bag, a discarded bus ticket, and a library note written from somebody named Casey Horn. So Flat Feet actually was right behind Cruz. Okay. And he went into the next shelter where Cruz had basically discarded his garbage in his gym red bag or his red gym bag. <laughs> Jeez, I'm having a tough time. <laughs> Back in town, the other two of his party of three, Biff and Cindy Bowen, were just basically retrieving mail, a uh, mail drop. They ate pizza. They got ice cream. They got some beer. So they were doing kind of what Molly and Jeff did. They went out and got some real food. Yeah. Uh, we're probably 
just getting some normal comforts before they hit the trail. Mm -hmm. It was close to 5 p.m. in the evening when they started climbing and about 6 when they reached the turnoff to Thelma Marks. So it took them about an hour to get to Thelma Marks. Cindy was an elementary school teacher and Biff was a jeweler. They knew they were close on Jeff and Molly's heels. So they were chasing these people. And that's why they, they all had, I think, a, an air of uh, hustle about them to catch up to these people. Yeah. They planned to celebrate Biff's upcoming birthday at Thelma Marks and were excited that they might be able to do so with a couple they'd followed for nearly three months. So they said, and this is a quote uh, from Cindy, We knew they were good people because we'd been reading their entries. They slowed as they approached the lean-to. The clearing was dead quiet. And an hour later, they were back in Duncannon phoning the state police. I saw blood around the face, the hands were tied, and I just turned around. Someone has been murdered. So that is what Biff said to his wife, Cindy. Basically, and I know we mentioned it in the beginning that he was the one that first came upon the bodies and Mm -hmm. basically instructed her to not look at it. Unfortunately, they came upon them in the evening and then did the hike all the way back down to Duncannon to to let the police know. So they so they found the bodies around 6 p.m. on September 13th of 1990. Correct. OK, so they they got back around 7 p.m. on the 13th to mm-hmm. phone the police. So known on the trail as the Lone Moccasins, that is the trail name for Cindy and Biff. They returned to Duncannon to report the crime. LaRue was face down with her hands tied behind her back with rope. Hood was partially naked and clutching a white shirt. A gunshot wound was clearly visible in the center of his back. The couple had been dead 12 to 16 hours before the lone moccasins came upon the murder scene. That night, detectives struggled for three hours to reach Thelma Marks. I think most of the conversation was curse words, recalls Pennsylvania State Trooper Bill Link. We were in dress shoes. It was dark. The crime scene unfolded piece by piece in the beams of their flashlights. Jeff was laying in the back corner, his head on a makeshift pillow. At first glance, Link wrote in his report, one would be led to believe that the subject was sleeping. At the other side of the lean-to, he wrote, the body of a female was observed laying face down in a pool of blood. LaRue had been tied up and raped before she was stabbed eight times in the neck, throat, and back by an eight and three-quarter inch double-edged blade. Hood was shot three times in the head, back, and abdomen by a twenty-two caliber pistol fired from about four feet away. And this was based on the gunpowder residue found at the scene. It took another four hours to get two ATVs up the mountainside on an old logging road. Troopers had to chop down trees to clear the way so that the bodies and evidence could be removed. After that, the investigation proceeded rapidly. From Karen Lutz, now remember, Karen was with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy and had seen Cruz twice the day he was going up to the shelter. Mm -hmm. She described Cruz and his red gym bags. They found one such bag at Thelma Marks and the other at the Darlington shelter. The library note that uh, Flat Feet had discovered gave them a name to go on. So they were actually looking for Casey Horn at this point. Yeah. So Glenda Hood, now this is um, Jeff Hood's mom, was at home in Signal Mountain, Tennessee, and she happened to switch on the radio on the morning of September 14th. So this is a day after the bodies were discovered just in time to hear the news report that two hikers had been murdered near Duncannon. Jeff had just called from there three days before. She knew her son was careful. In the past, when they had discussed someone meeting a bad end in the outdoors, he always told her he either didn't know what he was doing or he wasn't doing what he knew he should be. Just the same, she phoned Jim LaRue, and this is uh, Molly's dad, up in Shaker Heights, Ohio, and told him what she'd heard. She said he burst into tears immediately, and he said, I was sure it was them. I just knew. He saw Molly's mother, Connie, pull into the driveway with a load of groceries. He walked out and told her, I think this is going to be the longest day of our lives. So that's like that parental intuition that we always come across in a lot of these cases, like 
as soon as he heard it, like it's almost like you know, they had that feeling. I would venture to guess he had just a pit feeling that day, and that call was almost a confirmation of something he already felt. Yeah, it's just kind of weird when you go through these stories. You see the recounts from the people, the loved ones that were closest to the to the victims. It's almost like they they know what's going to happen. There's some sort of connection that goes above and beyond information they're hearing or seeing. So now I'm going to take a few excerpts here from Cruz defense attorney. And this is what we were talking about in the beginning. This is after his trial a year later, but it's important to paint the picture of what happened that night. And after Cruz left the shelter that morning. So his attorney was Jerry Philpot. And he says he believes the couple did reach the shelter first. He said they were setting down for the night. It was summer. It would have been pretty light out still. He came upon the scene and something happened. This is a brain on cocaine and a quart of Jim Beam, Philpot says of Cruz. He would take a quart of Jim Beam and a cigarette pack full of cocaine powder. And that is how he would hike. So, I mean, that's where it's, it's, in, it's insane wow. that, um, <laughs> that you get into, like, he's already obviously yeah. mentally destroyed. <clears throat> and now you're putting some sort of jet engine behind that by just, adding cocaine and alcohol and alcohol. Yeah. Which I, I back in my paramedic days when I'd come across people on drugs, you get somebody who's really coked out. It's like superhuman strength Mm -hmm. and not thinking clearly making very stupid decisions. Yeah. And that's just probably somebody who doesn't have an underlying mental condition. Exactly. That's somebody Um, that I'll say is quote unquote normal on a day to day basis. And we've all seen, you know, friends when they they've had a little too much to drink so yeah factor in the mental issues the you know the cocaine and now you know a a bottle of Jim Beam and you know you can kind of see how something like this could happen yeah I mean to do stuff like that that that's horrific yeah You, you you can't be a normal person let alone on without some sort of drug enhancement to make it to make yourself go through with something so horrific and awful so Cruz shared very little information with him, and this is his his uh, attorney. He says he never wanted to talk about this incident or any of his alleged murderous incidents. In the days following the murder, and this is we're we're now kind of cutting back to the real time on the trail. Mm-hmm. So in the days following the murder, Cruz would meet and interact with a few other hikers on the trail. Based on the conversations later recounted to law enforcement. Cruz had assumed Jeff and Molly's stories as well as their gear. So he basically took on their personas. Yeah. Cruz said he'd started hiking in Maine around the 1st of June and was trying to catch up with Muskrat, one of the through hikers the couple and Earl have met. So he's actually, and this kind of leads into, if he's telling their story, he talked to them because he wouldn't know this information. He wasn't reading log entries the whole way. Yeah. So he knows, you know, trail names. He knows where they started. He's knowing information about them. So maybe he, when they met, it wasn't, you know, violent at first. Maybe he got to know them a little bit. Yeah. Um, Which is very, very creepy and very, very disconcerting for sure. Yep. So Earl Swift, and this is again, our writer from the outside magazine, who's telling the story, uh, most of the story was still on the trail hiking in Virginia's uh, Shenandoah National Park. When a pair of day hikers informed him that a couple had been killed on the trail up in Pennsylvania five days before. Earl called home immediately to find out more information and learned that it was unfortunately Molly and Jeff. He writes in the article that he spent the next few days stunned in disbelief. He was attempting to catch up to a through hiker he had come in and out of contact with named Marcus Markel, uh, Marcus Markalusa of Tennessee. His trail name was Granola. Earl caught up with Granola and another southbound through hiker. He said the main topic of their conversation was obviously the killings. At that time, what they did not know was that Cruz was in custody of federal park rangers in Harper's Ferry, having been captured only a few hours before as he walked across a bridge in the uh, walked across a bridge over the Potomac. There was actually a hiker who'd embarked on a freelance search for the killer and recognized Jeff's pack on his back and sounded the alarm. So this is that foreshadowing from before that 
bright green Gregory pack that really stood out actually helped. And it sounds like, um, you know, even in the era before internet, it, it sounds like the, the story of these murders kind of started spreading on the trail pretty quickly. Yeah. So it's, I think it's very evident that news got a hold of it. And when that happens, yeah. if you're in search of a story, you could probably find it. And like I said, like I'm remembering going back and reading newspapers and things like that, watching television. Um, it, I'm sure it was easy to get information on if you were trying to find it. Yeah. Cruz was jailed pending trial. A lawman in Pennsylvania began putting together their case. The families of the couple actually became very close as they grieved over the deaths of their children. So discussions even began and questions were raised whether the trail should be shut down. Wow. So, so they, they were contemplating shutting the whole Appalachian trail down at this yeah, time. Yeah, this, this is not the family. This is just kind of, and again, I can't, I mean, there really isn't like some sort of like board for the trail yeah. that makes all the decisions, but it was some serious, I mean, this was a, a gruesome murder and nothing like this had ever happened, especially in the backcountry hiking community, which yeah. if you think about it, there should not be anything violent going on there. And after this happened, it really shook everybody. Mm-hmm. So Jim, and this is Molly's father said, that's when Molly's voice would come up and tell me, if you ever let my death be an excuse for anything to happen to the trail, I'll never forgive you. So he was yeah, fervently against anything like that happening. Mal was where she wanted to be, doing what she wanted to do, caring about what she wanted to care about, having fun and meeting and enjoying so many people, he says. To die doing something you love is not the worst thing in life. There are no guarantees. Her dad was obviously very strong. Yeah. through this whole thing to be in that type of state. Cause I don't know how I would react in that case. And I don't know if I would be that calm and that reflective on arguably doing the more right thing. You know, I it's you, you get in that said, like I'd probably want to go murder the guy and I'd be full of rage and vengeance. And he seemed to be in a place of peace, mm-hmm. which is, I mean, just confusing to me. Cause it kind of, it makes me upset thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, I can I can see the one side of it. At, you know, the parent, you know, your kid was killed in a gruesome murder. You'd probably, I could see you wanting revenge. I could see you wanting the trail closed down, things like that. But on the flip side, you know, as both of us do backcountry hike quite a bit, if something ever happened to me, I would definitely not want the area I was hiking to be closed down or, you know, anything like that because, you yeah. You know, we know the risks of going out into the backcountry. Absolutely. And we, tr- we try to prepare for anything that can happen, but you never know. You wouldn't want your legacy to be tied with something that took yeah. away some beautiful thing in nature. Yeah. And I think Jim realized that and was very vocal about, I think, just saying that's not even on the table. Molly would never have that. So that was that's kind of neat. That's a strong mm-hmm. place to come from. Glenda Hood, so this is Jeff's mom, climbed Cove Mountain on May 12th, 1991. So the first Mother's Day after the murder, she actually climbed it. And she said the trail was a bloom in wildflowers, Jack in the pulpits, native Columbine, which almost seemed a message, a gift from Jeff and Molly. She ventured into the clearing. I expected it to be dark, a sinister place, and it wasn't, she says. The sun was coming down through the trees, and it was a peaceful place, despite what had happened there. I considered that Jeff and Molly were murdered in God's cathedral, she says. If someone were murdered in God, God's cathedral, then murder could be committed any place. So she was not, I think, dealing with it too well, especially, I mean, it's Mother's Day. so yeah. But it, it's neat that she was able to go get some level of closure there and experience arguably what they've been experiencing for months, you know, the yep. beauty of nature, the beauty of what our country has to offer and, and through a neat trail. And she got to feel that for a little bit. So testimony in the trial started three days after Glenda's hike, actually on May 15th, 1991, the state presented 60 witnesses and 158 pieces of evidence that spun an inescapable web around Cruz. He'd been arrested wearing Jeff's pack boots and wristwatch, and he was carrying both murder weapons. He left his own gear at the scene, some of which was traced back to the tobacco farm in South Carolina. DNA linked him to Molly's rape. 
Cruz was convicted and sentenced to death by lethal injection. Over the years since, family, friends, fellow hikers that met the couple on the trail have hiked portions of the AT in their memory. On September of 2000, Karen Lutz informed Earl that the lean-to would actually be torn down. He writes, We stood there together under a tall sassafras tree, songbirds chatty in the branches, and eyed the careworn and mouse-infested Thelma Marks for the last time. So Karen reached out to Earl, and he actually made the trip to see the shelter be torn down. And again, just to reference, Karen was the caretaker for that section of 18. Earl was our writer uh, who wrote the Outside Magazine article. So to, I mean, to back up to the the trial quickly. So, I mean, this looks like an open and shut case. Oh, obviously. absolutely. I, I don't think there's any doubt that Cruz was responsible for the murders. Yeah. So if you're looking for a big twist, it was very clear <laughs> there wasn't going to be one. Um, it was just more, again, like the storytelling of it at all. You mentioned he was um, convicted and sentenced to death by lethal injection. Was he actually executed? Oh, we will get to that. Ah. That I am going to make you wait for because there okay. is going to be more information about him. I won't try and tease anyone. It's none of its major bombshells, so I don't want to keep anyone on the edge of their seat. But yeah, at this point, it's 2000, so about 20 yeah. years ago, which is insane to me. I know, um, right? Karen and, and Earl stood and watched as they tore down the Thelma, Mar- Thelma Marsh shelter, and he writes, The event really seemed to mark the end of the trail's innocence. And this uh, this is what Lutz told him. In the years after the killings, hikers were more apt to bring pepper spray along with their freeze-dried meals and to take the dogs along. The ATC had become far more sensitive to reports of disquieting conduct on the trail and quicker to intervene. Earlier in the year, the organization had even published a 176-page handbook called Trail Safe, Averting Threatening Human Behavior in the Outdoors. This week is always a tough one, Lutz said. There's a certain quality of the light at this time of year, and the temperatures suddenly get cooler and the humidity drops off, and it all comes right back. Not long after, the crews removed the old shelter's corrugated metal roof, dismantled its log walls, and sawed them up. They burned the wood in a bonfire, scattered the rock foundation. It was an exorcism as much as it was a demolition. When they finished, nothing remained of the old hut but a bald patch in the forest floor, not even its name. They called the new place the Cove Mountain Shelter. The forest got busy reclaiming the footprint. It looks like after this, the events of this, you know, murder happened, uh, it almost seems like people became hypersensitive to you know, reports of things going on the trail, probably almost to the point of you know, overreaction. Yeah, and that's, that's what it sounded like, is they would, re- like, any little thing would get reported and people would kind of be a little gun shy. Yeah. Because I mean, obviously these murders were truly horrific, but I think you need to also kind of temper that with the fact that they're all of the thousands of people that hike that trail every year. And rarely is there an incident of this level of horrificness. Yeah. And I think you see this anytime, you know, everywhere when something really terrible happens, people tend to overreact. Well, it goes to that. The whole saying ignorance is bliss. And, and, I like to think of it less of somebody who's dumb and more of, I can think back to many situations where I've went and done something and it was perfectly safe and we are careful, but then you hear something about the area you're in or about the thing you did that kind of scares you a little bit Yeah, and you never think about it the same way. So you think about hiking and camping and this happened to me when I was just in Montana after we started doing all of these shows. I looked at the trail just a little bit different knowing how many people had gone missing because I was never actively searching for those types of stories. Mm -hmm. So then when you really start thinking about it and even worse, thinking about all the people that have gone missing in Glacier where you're currently at, you kind of look around and look at the woods in a different way. I won't say it ruined it for me at all. I mean, it's still beautiful and I loved it, but I never thought about that at all. I was always going out there. It was going to be a fun hiking trip. You're worried about, you know, bear danger and food and what you're doing. Yeah. But you never think about, wow, like there's some experienced people that just disappeared here. What am I missing that got them that could get me? Yeah. I think for me, obviously I do see the trail differently than I did before we started doing the podcast, but um, I think it helps me also 
you know, prepare a little better. I, you know, I always, Oh, sure. I, you know, I always think about, you know, different circumstances and how, you know, how would I communicate out of the park? How would I do this? How would I do that? So I think in a way it's good to think about this because you, you know, going out into the wilderness is dangerous, especially if you're not prepared. So it's not something to take lightly. It's really fun to do. And I recommend everybody go backcountry hiking, but you got to be prepared and you got to know the risks. Yeah. It's something you just shouldn't take lightly. It's, we should not stop anybody from doing it. It's, in, you know, even with it's, I always say it sounds like everywhere we go, someone's going missing all the time. It's incredibly rare based on the numbers that go out, Yeah, but it's still, it's just, it's another thing that it's, it's, if you can prepare just a little bit more, you should. And in this day and age where we're so connected and everyone's on their phones, it's really amazing to be able to go, you know, a couple of days deep into a, a park, have no cell phone connection, no internet, and you're just in the woods and you can kind of, you know, recharge yourself. That's Absolutely. the way I look at it. It, Because there's no way to escape, you know, modern society you at your work all day and you've, you've family and your kids. And But when you're out in the woods, you know, you got nothing but the trail ahead of you. Absolutely. I totally and, uh, agree. Yeah, it's just a great way to to recharge the batteries. So, so we'll 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 talk a little bit. I want to give up the next few the next information is more updates on people and time. So, Connie Larue, this is Molly's mom, was unfortunately diagnosed with cancer and spent her final days in the hospice where she actually would volunteer. She awoke from a dream near the end to report that she'd actually seen Molly waiting for her. Glenda Hood. Uh, Jeff's mom was actually holding her hand shortly before she died. So they became very, very close. And she, Mm -hmm. she passed away in July of 2006. So she was with Jeff's mom. So it's, what's really neat is you could tell by how wonderful those people were that their families probably were also great people. Yeah. And it's like sappy in a way, like how marriage brings two families together these families still were able to come together. It was unfortunate circumstances, but they were close enough that Jeff's mom was with Molly's mom at the time that Molly's mom passed in July of 2006. So that's really, that's really neat. And Glenda continues to grieve in December, 2006 Cruz death sentence was replaced with a double life sentence without the possibility of parole. And Glenda spoke, and this is at the hearing that day, half my future was taken from me, she told Cruz. I have missed his wedding to Molly. I have missed seeing them share their lives together. I have missed their children, who'd be my grandchildren. Jim LaRue spoke to Cruz at the same hearing, echoing a message he thought his daughter would demand of him. And this, again, shows the type of guy that, that Jim was. Paul, I'm here today to offer forgiveness for what you have done. He told his daughter's killer, at which point he says, Cruz locked eyes with him and held the connection. I wish that you and I can now find peace. Molly had decided to devote her life to working with troubled children like you certainly were. Paul, I think it would be great if you could pick up where Molly left off, starting with yourself. Help the Mollies of the world learn who you are and try to enlist the help of other inmates to help in this effort. You are a gold mine of critical information that needs to be unearthed. Peace be with you, brother. He said in conclusion, peace be with you. So that must have been incredibly hard. I mean, when I read that, it hit me hard. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's like, you think about the power of making eye contact with somebody, like yeah. how some people can't even do it in just a normal conversation. He's staring into the eyes of a deranged psychopath that had probably a hell life. Yeah. Worse than any people that I know or you know, and I would never wish upon anyone. And he's able to look that guy in the eye, knowing what he did to his daughter and yep. to his what was supposed to be his son-in-law, and A, forgive him, and then ask him for help, and then offer him peace. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a powerful message, I think. I just think about in your daily life, you know, someone, you know, you know, maybe a a friend or a a loved one, they do something, how hard it is to forgive them over something probably, you know, and it's always small crap too. Yeah. Yeah, It's something small and dumb. And this, this guy was able to do this in, you know, looking his, his daughter's killer in the face. That's insane. Well, I'm guessing it probably brought him a lot of uh, peace to be able to forgive Cruz. Yeah. 
Molly and Jeff are never coming back. It probably doesn't do any good to, you know, bottle all that up and, you know, be angry the rest of your life. And obviously, yeah. you know, Cruz, he had some some bad mental conditions that we both know people with mental illness and it's it's a tough thing and it's not something that you can control. Uh, there's no excuse, obviously. That's why he's serving a double life sentence. Yeah, he'll he'll obviously be locked away forever. He's not getting out. So yeah. I mean, that that's good. Yep. I know there's horrific stories where like some paperwork thing goes wrong and somebody like that gets out on the street would just be catastrophic, obviously. Yeah. What's hard is because I've looked into trying to find out information about his prior life and he's so messed up. There's just very little information about him. And I think that's what Jim was trying to do is just say, you need to talk to, I th- and this is me assuming, so yeah. I could be wrong. I just want to get that out there for the listeners. This is my assumption. I assume when he says talk to the Mollies and help the Mollies of the world understand, I think he's talking about counselors or people that could learn from somebody like Cruz to try and figure out a way to avoid something like this in the future. Yeah. When he says you're a gold mine of critical information, it's, I don't think he's looking at him like he thinks, Oh, you've redeemed yourself and you're smart now and you can go help. It's more like don't sit in your cell quiet sulking. Yep. Like talk to the prison therapist, talk to these people who want to learn from you to find out what makes you tick so that we can stop this in the future. So yeah. there's not Paul Cruz's running around just wild anymore. So, yeah, no. And I think, um, this brings me back to a broader thing. I, sometimes I, I'll talk to people about various hikes we do and I'll tell them I'm less concerned about the wildlife and more concerned about the human life out on the trail. Even though, like we said, it's, you know, people going missing in parks or this kind of thing happening in a park is really rare. It's still something I think about when I'm hiking. Yeah, um, absolutely. We've, we've come across a couple, you know, real strange individuals over the years, and it always gives you pause. You don't know what people are thinking, what their intentions are. Even here in Wisconsin, I've been up north hunting with my dad and we'll be going down a trail and out of the no out of nowhere these strange people come uh walking out of the woods and they're they're bow cutters if you don't know what a bow cutter is they're basically people that they go out in the woods and they cut pine trees to make wreaths okay they, they most of the time they get permits from the state to do it but they know the area really well so they just go wandering out into the woods and sometimes you'll be out on a trail deep in the forest and all of a sudden a couple of them will just come wandering out. And it's always unsettling uh, (laughs) to say the least, at least at that you have shotguns in your hand. So it's not like you can defend yourself at least, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, This, this case in no way makes me not want to hike the AT. I still want to do it. Cause of all, of all the few people we've met that have been weird, We've met hundreds yeah. of amazing people. Oh, yeah. I mean, the type of people that fill up the trails and want to be outside as opposed to in the house on the computer. Yeah. It's usually great people. It really is. And I, I love meeting and interacting with people in backcountry. And I'll say this. Unfortunately, the, the parks are getting busier and busier by the year. Yeah, that's like the fortunately, but unfortunately, unfortunately, thing. unfortunately, uh, a lot of people are out there enjoying the national parks. But unfortunately, it means the peak mm. times are going to I mean, it, the trails are going to be crowded. Yep. <laughs> um, when we were in the Tetons, it was, it was pretty packed. And I know uh, you remember when we were coming out as the, the Narrows, how, how packed it was Oh yeah, <laughs> down by the, yeah. the part where you kind of, you can park and walk in. Yep. I mean, hundreds of people. It's like the blessing and a curse. Cause we hate that it's packed, but we've been walking so long. As soon as you start seeing people in flip flops, you're like, we're so close. <laughs> I'll tell I'll tell everybody listening one, one national park you can go to that will not be packed. Canyonlands. Uh, oh, that place is hard. But that's to hike. also one. Yeah. That's also where you shouldn't go if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Like our first year we went backcountry hiking, uh, Canyonlands. We, yeah, that, that's a story for another podcast episode, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, Joe, this was, um, an interesting, uh, a case and definitely something different than what we normally do. Yeah. I think, I think we'll sprinkle some of these in here and, just because, like I, I, I said at the beginning of part one, we always deal with these cases that end with not knowing anything. Yeah. So I, I read this, and again, I think what really got me was um, 
like I said, the end, you know, Jim talking to his daughter's killer at the end really, really gripped me Yeah, hard. I just, I really, I like the story. I said it in the first episode, go read the Outside Magazine article that Earl Swift wrote. He is a writer. He's got some books out on the topic, but he goes into great detail above and beyond what I did just about the goings on of the trail and more information about the people. Um, We wanted to cut it out so we weren't doing a three-part going crazy here, but it's a great article, so go check it out. And um, we'll put the link online. We'll put the link online. Um, Keep the comments coming. We we do get a lot of comments from people. You know, some people get angry. They they think we're... uh, being disrespectful to the families and the people going missing. That's not our intention. Joe and I, we're, we try to take something that's, you know, serious and kind of add a little levity into it just because that's kind of who we are. That's. Yeah. I, I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned this because we, we get overwhelmingly positive remarks, but I do want people to know just, we, we don't take it lightly. And I have a weird problem in my, my wife's got it too because we're both in medical profession. If anyone's like a paramedic or an EMT or a nurse, uh, it's bad Schadenfreude. Where <laughs> honestly, it's it's sometimes to deal with some of the crazy crap you see out there. It's I don't even want to say you make jokes of it, but you can look it up and it's overwhelmingly the case, and it kind of helps you do that. So yeah, if you ever hear us laughing about something or goofing or whatever. We do take it seriously. And in a lot of these cases, we're actually in contact with the family members or at least friends or close relatives. And we ask them, we just say, hey, especially with Paul Miller's, because that was more recent. We just said we're I was emailing with his sister quite often just saying, hey, is there something you want me to talk about? Is there something you didn't like? Uh, Because we do want to be respectful. And they in that case specifically, they were just happy that we were helping bring more attention to it. And they actually, they actually got messages and people were going out and we were kind of re-energizing the search efforts and that made them feel better. And again, I'm sure in that episode, we, we probably laughed about a thing or two or joked and it's never our intention to laugh at either someone's missing family member or if they had a disability or anything like that. But a lot of times you'll find the, the family of the people going missing just want any kind of publicity or any they want to keep the thought of their missing loved one alive in the hopes that they eventually get closure because a lot of times these cases will happen the search will happen a couple news articles will get written and then it'll just kind of disappear people move on to the next story the next case and you know you never really hear about it again in the case of arvin nelson for many years the family and friends of arvin would kind of meet in big sur and go on kind of a a little reflection hike every year and, you know, kind of keep his memory alive. You know, a lot of times they don't have any closure. They never get closure. So, and that's, it's a good reminder. I really, if you're listening, go on Facebook and check out the Arvin Nelson group. I think that's a great example of what was really, really cool and organic about that. As we did the first episode, I think it was episode five on Arvin Nelson. And the reason that interview that Mike did with his two friends came about is because they heard the podcast and they said, Hey, we were we hiked with him. We know about him because in episode five we couldn't get that much information just from the news out. We we got as much information as we could from the news and the research, and they contacted us and said, "Hey, you got this wrong. You got this wrong." And we're like, "That's great. We're, I'm we we're, we're thrilled that they called. We're like, let's get you on. Let's talk. If you're willing to talk, we want to learn about him." And then because of that episode uh, where they mentioned Drew, Drew heard the podcast and started this thing, and now you have this whole community of people sharing wonderful stories about Arvin. They're sharing yeah. their fondest memories. They're sharing their theories about what happened. They're, you know, they're, they're able to really talk about it. And it was something that keeps kind of going away as time goes on. And I think this is therapeutic for them. And, and, you know, it's his high school friends, it's his college friends. It's all these people are coming out of the woodwork and it is because they heard the show. So that's really neat for us. And we're happy if we can do that for people. So absolutely. I'll, I'll leave it um, at that. Yeah. One final thing. I, I don't know which episode coming up. It's coming up soon. Joe and I will be doing a real fun episode, kind of a, a X-Files uh, feel to it. <laughs> Joe, you know what yeah. I'm talking about. Yes. Yep. Um, I'm really excited to do this one. We've been I've been talking about it with Joe for months now. It'll be it'll be similar to kind of the Alaska Triangle, but bigger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm real excited. It, it, it'll be a fun one. I know a lot of the people that listen to our show are, 
know, kind of into that kind of stuff too. So we want to, oh, you know, as as are we. Yeah, <laughs> X Files is one of my favorite shows of all I time. Know. So, um, with that, I don't have any other updates. Yeah, I say uh, just just as always, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Follow us on Instagram. And if you're out hiking, camping, backcountry in the woods, leave no trace. <laughs> <laughs>